All right, so there were 11 themes of biology that we talked about in class and that were listed in the PowerPoint that was posted on your website. Please remember you have a link to the website in Jupyter Grades on files and uh, links. Now, when you take a look at the themes of biology, you'll see that there are, uh, the first one is that there are commonalities or things that all living things share. And all living things sh on, on Earth share these seven common characteristics. So if we were looking at life, we should be able to identify all seven of these in any life form. And we went through all seven of these. I'm not going to go through them now. And you have uh, on, your, on one of your handouts the actual definition of all seven. You also will find these in the first PowerPoint in, with, in detail. Systems we also talked about in, in great detail. And you should be able to identify a system. I should be able to give you any system that, that, court, that has uh, components that work together. Uh, for instance, a car, a car engine. Uh, would be a system that we discussed in class. Uh, another another system we dis discussed in class and showed examples of were organ systems. Each of these have components that work together uh, to get uh, to function. Another system we talked about was an ecosystem. So again, in any in any kind of system, no matter what the example, what you're going to look what you're going to look for are is a key characteristic of components that work together. For a single function or for some function. So that's going to be really important when you're given an example of whatever. It could be any, any given example of a car engine, of an organ system, of an ecosystem, of a living being, of, of a pond, of a, a beaker full of material, of anything that's functioning, that's doing something, uh, specifically the systems in life. So in a system in life, you're looking for for instance, organelles and how they, uh, how they function. You're looking for components, and, those com and so anywhere in life, you should be able to find components that work together in some kind of system. Another theme of life that we seem to find repeatedly over and over again throughout the study of life is this idea that life is organized into, into kind of a hierarchy, where things go from very small, hierarchy meaning that's, uh, there's steps, so think of it as a ladder. And the higher you go, the larger the, the scale. And with each level, there's, there's new characteristics or new uh, qualities that show up that weren't there before in the lower levels. And yet, there's also a reflection of, of what's going on in the lower levels as well. So when we think of a molecule, when we think first let's think of an atom. So if we have an atom, let's say it's made of, one atom is made of, uh, of carbon, it's a carbon atom, and you link them together, they form a molecule. So this single one is an atom, and we'll talk more about this next week. But one's an atom, and many linked together in bonds, is called a molecule. So when we look, take a look at that molecule, and that's kind of the first level of organization here, or hierarchy. So that would be the first rung or the lowest rung, the smallest component. All right, of a cell, let's say. Of course, atoms would be the smallest component. 
So a molecule has a certain characteristic. They react, they act, but they don't act as a unit. So you could have a, a, a beaker full of fat, uh, let's say uh, corn oil, and it's going to act in a certain way. But it doesn't act in, in a, any kind of real function. It doesn't function. It might react as you add chemicals, but it won't function as, uh, as a unit. Where if you take a bunch of molecules and create what's called an organelle, now all of a sudden you have a structure, and we can take a look at, let's say, a Golgi body. It's, and it looks like this a little bit. That makes vesicles, it processes fat. And even though this is still made of fat, it has oils, it's made of oil and lipids, this actually functions. It changes things in a very, very specific way and acts and reacts and, and responds to the environment in a very specific way. So it actually receives and sends out this organelle called a Golgi body, functions in a cell as part of a system. Now we take a look at tissues. Because you, if you take a, these organelles you, and these cells, right? So the next level would be cells, which isn't listed here, but... Oh, yes, it is. There it is. Cells. And... As you make these cells, and each cell has different organelles, a Golgi body, endoplasmic reticulum, ribosomes. You don't need to all, know all the parts right now, but you will eventually. Um, it has an endoskeleton, or cytoskeleton rather, and, a, and it has an extracellular matrix, and all kinds of things. This cell is doing so much. You put a bunch of them together, and all of a sudden, you have this tissue has a specific shape, and they might function its function. So individually, this cell might just function, uh, let's say it just holds itself together very well. But put them all together in a specific fashion, now all of a sudden you might have uh, skin, right? Uh, this could be a part of a fingerprint. So you have uh, skin. Now, this individual cell doesn't act as skin, but together, all the cells working together start to start to show certain new novel characteristics that, you know, for repelling water and allowing, uh, developing structures called pores. Pores are made out of skin, obviously, and at the bottom is are specialized cells that let out sweat, and there might be a hair follicle in there making hair, and... So there's all kinds of, uh, t the tissue skin has all kinds of cells, each individual cell doing a different function, but together all these, all these different cells all the, in this tissue are making a specific function that, we, that, that accounts for what skin does. And this, these novel characteristics keep showing up as we move up this hierarchy of organization. But the key is that there's a hierarchy of organization. There's a scale to it. Each level evolving and showing you something different, something, uh, you know, I don't want to say more interesting because the cell has a lot of interesting stuff going on in it and, that, and, and an ecosystem has a lot of stuff going on in it and the biosphere has a lot of stuff going on in it. And just it, as you move up, though, things get, uh, there's more and more factors to consider. There are many more uh interactions between many more and many different uh, uh, scenarios. So because there are different scenarios, there's different organisms, there's different uh, considerations, different factors, there's new, new characteristics show up as, as you go from the molecule all the way up to the biosphere. So that's the point. That's the point of the hierarchy of organization and that new properties arrange, emerge as each level as you go up because each level is different in the sense, even though it's made, even though an organelle is made of molecules, it acts differently because it's it, the interaction between the molecules that make up the organelle 
allow it to do things that, the mo that a molecule by itself couldn't do. And the interaction between the different organelles allow it to function in ways that an organelle by itself could not handle. And a bunch of cells together, uh, as in the example of skin, are able to do something that a cell by itself, a skin cell by itself, could not do. And a bunch of skin together, a bunch of skin samples together as a whole, create then an organ, and that organ can do, can do something that skin tissue by itself could not do, etc., all the way up to the biosphere. So each component underneath it is, is equally as important as the thing that comes above it, but there's just new characteristics or properties that show up as you move up through the, uh, the hierarchy of organization. So cell structure and functional units of life. Cells are the structural and functional units of life. And we'll go through that again. That's just a simple fact, it, it, but it's also true. And why is it we call it a theme? Uh, why is this fact? Well, of course, it's, a, it's true. It's a fact. But this fact, cells are the, uh, the structural and functional units of life. Why do we call that a theme? Because consider that the fact that uh, cells and structural are, are the structural and functional units of life means that wherever we find life, we're going to find cells. So that becomes important to understand that wherever we find life, we're going to find these characteristics. Wherever we find life, we will find a system or several systems all interplaying with each other. We will find a hierarchy to life. Life will will start with a molecule and can be a component of each of these as you move up through the hierarchy. Life will be made of cells. Life, living organisms interact with their environment, exchanging matter and energy. That's what all life does. If, it, if, this, if you find a new beastie in a forest, you can look for, or, uh, you can look for its interaction with that environment. You look for it eating and it pooping and it taking, uh, making energy or it, it, it using energy, something's going on that where this theme is, you will find it in that life form. The unity of life is based on DNA and common genetic code. What does that mean? Well, when we take a look at the unity of life, we have to take a look at the idea that when we look at a uh, at a flower, that flower, no matter how different it is from a fish, no matter how different that fish is from the flower, it's ha they both have a unity in the sense that we can find DNA that is the same in both. Even though one lives on land, the other in the water, even though one's an animal, the other's a plant, DNA can, can unify them. There are things that the, that the fish does and, then, and the flower does. There are, there are structural units, parts of this hierarchy that you can find in a fish and in a flower. And that's true of all life on Earth. So there are these characteristics. Of course, there's this generalized set of characteristics. But there's DNA. There are, there are very, very specific sequences of DNA. So it would be something like A, T, G, C, etc. That are exactly the same between a flower and a fish. And since DNA is only inherited from an ancestor, that's how DNA, that's how you get the code that you have in your DNA. You inherit it from someone who came before you. What I hope you understand is that means that these two, these two organisms are related. They had a common ancestor somewhere down the line. Of course, the more similar their DNA is, the closer their relationship, the relationship is between them. So there's unity that you can find in DNA in the, that you can find in common genetic code between these two organisms. Overall, also, you have to consider that all life on Earth 
has this DNA code and then processes DNA in pretty much the same way. There are subtle differences, uh, as, and evolution would explain those differences, but there's a, there's a unity that comes from the fact that all life uh, uses in some way DNA as part of, its, of doing its function. The diversity of life can be arranged into three domains. Well, we'll look at that in just a minute, uh, but and just know that, that what that means is that we have three domains as a group. Just let's start with that. The word domain is a group. It's a grouping like mammal or like family rather, or or uh, species. And a domain is the biggest group. So under the umbrella of domain, there's three of them, one, two, and three. Under one domain is all eukaryotic, what that means is that all, all life that has a nucleus, it goes back to that cell that we talked about a minute ago when the organelles, and one of those organelles in that cell is a nucleus, and that nucleus has the DNA, has DNA. And DNA, that is what we find here in the eukaryotic cell, in, the, in, in this eukaryotic group, this eukary eukaryotic domain. In another domain, in these two domains, what we find are prokaryotic cells. And in prokaryotic cells, those are, those are cells that don't have a nucleus. They have DNA, because that's, you know, that's one of the unifying themes of biology of life. But prokaryotic cells have no nucleus, no organelles in, in, that have membranes. And we'll talk about membranes and we'll figure out what they are soon enough. The next theme of biology that's listed here in your summary is that evolution explains the unity of life. The explanation for why a flower has the same DNA as, as a fish the explanation of why you can get uh, different uh, organisms flying in different ways and yet have common ancestors further back uh, and have ancestors more locally that don't fly is this idea of evolution. A little bit convoluted, a little bit uh, complicated rather, uh, and convoluted to some extent, I must say, it's, it really is the best explanation that we have for all these facts that, we're, that I will list out for you uh, on life. And therefore, it is one of the, if not the bedrock of modern biology, understanding how all these things work and interact. Scientific inquiry is used to ask and answer questions about nature. All right, so that is just the idea that biology is science. We collect data, we do the scientific method. That's all that's meaning. That we, we, do, a, we do science in order to, talk, to discover and describe all the things that life is made of and that makes up life. Science, technology, and society. Well, that example, this was an example that we talked about on two days. We had a speaker come in and talk to you about factory farming. And that's about science, technology, and society. We have all this technology that goes into agriculture and goes into growing food and growing and raising animals and feeding us at McDonald's and Burger King. There's a whole several, there are many industries that surround, that surround this process of, uh, that we call the, the food industry. And there's a lot of explanations, a lot of reasons why. We looked at a lot of that. The idea since science, technology, and society is the idea that we do a lot in biology, we do a lot in science, but then that, that science then gets translated in technology, which is an application of basic science research. So just because we understand what DNA is, for instance, somebody, Watson, Crick, and Rosalind Franklin, they... They worked on the structure of DNA. After that, other people looked at the function of DNA, where they, they discovered how DNA is replicated, how we control it, what genes are, 
how, what are all the pieces and parts of a gene. And before you know it, we're developing technology to change the, to add DNA to a fish or take DNA away from a fish or change the DNA that's in the fish to, for our purposes. We call those GMOs. And that's all about using that basic science research to develop technology that's going to address problems that we feel are important as a society. But as you can see, based on our last two days, those, those solutions can sometimes and often does lead to other problems. So there's constantly this interaction between science, technology, and society. That happens no matter what you do in, in, in science research. If you discover something, there's no telling what, you're gonna, what it's going to turn into. Einstein and many of his physicists, uh, many of the physicists of his time, studied nuclear, the atom, nuclear power. It wasn't until World War II was full, fully underway that they discovered that someone discovered a use of that of that science, a technology, that we call the atom bomb, and that impacted society. So whether you're talking about food the way we've been talking about it for biology, or you're talking about genetic. Uh, manipulation or cloning or you're talking about uh, you know physics and the and the development of the nuclear weapon no matter what science technology and society all work together and are con and, and we need to find ways of we need to find ways of making society technology and science all work together more harmoniously then, of course, there's structure and function. And that goes along with any time you have a, a structure, uh, that it must have a function that's related to that structure. And if it's, something's going to function, then its structure has to relate to that function somehow. So when we, look at, when we look at a fin, we should be looking at something that's probably web that's able to push through water and move the fish forward. We look at an eye. It should be allowed. It should be a structure that allows for light to come in and must be connected to the brain so that it can be interpreted. When we look at a flower, we it should its leaves of a plant. The leaves should be able to pick up light. Usually broad, wider. Uh, sometimes they're needle-like, but they're green. Their their structure relates to how they function, what they do. Wings are wings, whether they're on bats or birds or butterflies. Their structure is are, are similar, very similar as, as, as between wings, butterfly, uh, butterflies and wings of birds and wings of bats. The material they're made of is different. The details of the structure are different. But the, the bottom line general structure is a wing looks like a wing. That's why a plane has wings, because that's what you need for flying. So a function and structure are related to each other directly. So that's important because as we study biology, we'll find things, we'll find certain structures and their clues in the structure that lead to have you, uh, that lead to a lot or that allow you to understand the function of that, of that structure that you discovered. Sometimes you discover a function that tells you information about the structure of the thing that does it. So both, this is very informative in, uh, in biology. It's a very important theme to move forward in, especially when we talk about enzymes. All right, let's move forward. So when you look at nature, we look at this beautiful uh, oasis. Uh, there's obviously humans have been here and they've created roads and walkways. But when you look at nature, you look at this environment, you can apply all 11 of those themes to describe and understand this ecosystem. So first, in this ecosystem, you will find things that are alive that contain all the properties of life. They'll have order, they'll, they'll react to their environment, they'll process energy, etc. No matter what life you pick, the tree, the bush, the snake, the rabbit, the human, no matter what's alive here, fungus, it's all going to do these, these basic seven characteristics of life. They're, they have to, or they're not, they can't function right as life. This whole thing is an ecosystem. 
But then we can break down those systems. You can take a look at this system here, this aquatic ecosystem here versus this terrestrial ecosystem out here. You could take a look at this system here. The components of it are probably some fish, some some uh, some type of amphibians, some uh, reptiles, uh, humans. Uh, there's you know so there's all kinds. Of maybe I mean I, I don't know if there's any freshwater mammals here, but in all the in this in this water source here, what you're going to see is you're going to you're going to find a series of components that all work together. In other words, this is a system. There's another system out here, this system of trees and, and bushes, and, and the, the understanding of this ecosystem is first understand the components of it, and then understand how these components all work together. As the grasses and the trees hold back the erosion so that the, land, so that the soil can, can sustain the other trees and, and grasses, and they, they can sustain the rabbits and the butterflies and the, and, the, and the wolves or whatever else lives in this environment. So as you move as you move and understand the components, you start to understand the ecosystem as a whole. Of course, this ecosystem, whether it's the aquatic or the terrestrial you're looking at, this ecosystem here, the whole thing, if you think about it, it absolutely has a hierarchy, right? There's a, you can look at the at the molecules that make up the organelles or the or the molecules that make up the sand or the or the fertilizer. Or you can look at the pH of the water. You can look at it at the molecular level. Or you can look at it at the organelle level. You can look and compare organelles between different species in, in the entire ecosystem. Or you can take a look at tissues. Or you can take a look at or cells or tissues or organs or organ systems or then organisms. Or you can start taking a look at, at, at any one of the hierarchies of life and start to compare. Again, under, trying to understand life and how it interacts with the environment is understanding each level of that hierarchy. No matter where you look in this in this environment, no matter where you look at it, you're going anywhere you find life, it's going to be made of cells. And those cells are going to be the very because cells are the basic structural and functional unit of life, anywhere there's life, there has to be cells. As you look at this ecosystem, you're going to find that each individual organism, each each life form here is going to interact with its environment. It's going to take energy and it's going to take matter out of this environment. These plants are sucking out energy from the sun's rays and they're taking CO2 out of the air. They're taking nitrogen out of the ground. They, the fish in the water are eating the smaller the plankton or the smaller fish. They're pooping into the water. The bacteria are eating the poop. They're there, every all the energy there's there's energy flowing from the sun throughout this ecosystem from the top the sun all the way down to the bottom, the 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 fungus uh, de destroying the the dead material the material itself the carbon dioxide taken out of the air, put into the plant and cycled out as that material rots as it dies and rots, over and over again this material is exchanged the energy is exchanged and transferred. And so this is, this is the nature of life, one of its themes. Looking at the DNA of all these organisms would give us an idea of how unified they are, how related they are. If we look at different organisms in the same area, we'll find some commonalities and some differences. And that gives us information, again, about how each of the components of life all support each other and to function as a unit. All this life can be characterized as either being eukaryotic and therefore being in one domain or they can be prokaryotic so it can be one of the other two domains archaea or or eubacteria but either way no matter which of the domains you can find that all life on this in this environment falls into one of those three domains yet how do we explain that the dna is so a, is similar but it's different. So how do we how do we how do we explain the diversity that we see here? The plants, the grass, the fish, the snails, the fungus, all of it, and yet also also explain at the same time that there are very 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 similar sequences that can only be explained that they, we all had by the fact that all these living things had the same ancestors. So how can something have the same ancestor and yet be so diverse, so different? 
The answer is this word, is this concept of evolution, which we will study. So if we want to study this environment, we want to study these organisms and all the different levels that we just discussed, then we would probably do it, if we're, if we're biologists, we would probably do it using the scientific method. We would ask, ask a question, come up with a hypothesis, we would, we would set up an experiment, we would, we would make observations, we would collect data, we would have a control group, and we would then do a statistical analysis on the results, we would come up with a, an explanation and finally a conclusion to that answer, and then we would choose whether that was satisfactory or did, or did it support the hypothesis or did it reject the hypothesis. If you rejected the hypothesis, then what's the new one? And we just would continue to study, and that's how we study things in science, as you well know. When we, when, we, when we do things in science, we follow the scientific method, a method designed and ev that itself has evolved over time to really just study in a very logical, controlled fashion. And of course, when we take a look at an environment like this and we try to apply our knowledge, we might decide how to, we, it might help us understand our knowledge of this environment, might help us understand how we might build stairs and buildings that allow us to keep the beauty of the environment, support the structures that exist there, and and still enjoy nature at, without destroying it. So this would be an application of science, technology, and society. As you see, this society is working very closely and well with nature. Okay, these are just slides that we covered in class. Uh, some, um, some of them we covered class. They're basically examples of each of these things that I just discussed and summarized for you. Here you'll find all the different definitions that you might need. Uh, you have this as a, as a PDF on your website. Uh, these are just ex uh, examples. As we looked in that forest, there could be a bear, an Asian bear, or Asian brown bear coming down to grab uh, uh, some salmon or whatever other fish is in that stream. Uh, you no matter where you look, you'll find order in, in, in that environment. There's going to be a response to the environment. There's going to be regulation. There's going to be reproduction. There's going to be evolutionary adaption. Uh, there's going to be processing that energy. There's going to be growth and development. So there's these, there's these common characteristics of life that, that you'll see. In, and these big seven are, are, are is are the characteristics you're going to see over and over again anywhere you look for life. And again, the hierarchy of life, all detailed for you here. Uh, again, you have the PDF on your, on your website. We, we went over it in class early and just summarized it for you. Here again is, a, is the hierarchy in a nice graphic. Emergent properties. And, and each of the things we just talked about uh, are described here fairly clearly. Uh, you know, when we look at use all cells, use DNA as their genetic information. So we're talking about cells as structural units of life. And so when you look at this and you see prokaryotic cells, this is just developing more of this idea that all cells are their structural and functional units of life. So we will look at prokaryotic cells, we'll look at eukaryotic cells, but know that all life has is made of cells. And this, do I need you to understand or organize or memorize the shape of a cell? No. But understand that when we look at a cell, all life has these components. Now, this is a eukaryotic cell, and this is a prokaryotic cell. So understand that when we're talking about this, these cells, they, when we're looking at these cells, they're different, but they're both forms of cells. And we'll take a look at what, what makes up a cell, what defines a cell as we move forward post uh, the chemical makeup of life. Systems in biology, again, we discussed it in, 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 uh, in detail, and uh, there's not much more to say about that. Look at your previous notes. Here again, you see uh, structural cells are structural functional units of life. Living organisms interact with each other in their environment, exchange matter and energy. That's just the idea that living systems eat and they poop. They process energy. They you know, animals eat and they use energy and they provide CO2 and they throw out waste. They urinate out. This is what living animals do. Plants take in CO2 and light and, uh, and water and they produce oxygen gas in excess and they use some of that oxygen to do respiration because they eat their own food. 
So this is just uh, you know part of that concept that there's this exchange of org of uh, there's this exchange of material uh, throughout the ecosystem, throughout the environment, and living things, whether it be plants or animals. So this is a common theme in biology that all living things interact with their environment and exchange in matter and energy. But notice that at each level, of, at each hierarchical level, the, that this exchange of matter and energy looks different, right? So as decomposers, they re uh, recyclers, they exchange matter and, and minerals. Uh, they eat dead things and they release the minerals back into the ground. Uh, but then consumers eat plants, and plants are producers. They provide the food for the whole ecosystem. So this is kind of what goes on in general, very generally, in an ecosystem. Do you have to know all this detail? No, we're going to cover it in detail. What you have to understand, if it's alive, it's exchanging matter and energy. That's the key. And again, another example, uh, there's two major processes that happen in ecosystems. Uh, we, do we li really need to know all this detail? Uh, no, not really. These are just examples to help you understand what's going on with this particular theme. Again, one more, uh, this, this time as a picture, what's going on with the cycling of energy and, and matter. All right, so the idea that life is based on DNA and common genetic code, well, here it is. It's just simply that DNA has genes, and genes are, are sent from parent to offspring, and we'll, de we'll be studying this in detail. But in every, in fact, the, ba the bottom line is that every one of these themes, this, this is what we will be studying throughout the year. We'll, each unit will focus on one of these themes. And, of course, because these themes run throughout all of biology, even though we'll focus on one of the themes, there's always going to be overlap. So when you take a look at a species, for instance, and you take a look at DNA on a common genetic code, a species of genes that are coded for in sequences of four building blocks, and that's what genes are, and a, a species genes, and they in a double helix, all forms are of life are use essentially the same code, that's a really big important idea that unifies life. Uh, and we translate it about the same way. We use, and of course, we take that DNA, we make them into proteins. Bacteria do it, humans do it, birds do it, fish do it. Uh, diversity of life arises when there's differences in that DNA sequence. How did we get those differences? We call that the reason and the method of getting differences in DNA is called evolution. This is what DNA looks like. Do you have to know it right now? No, we will learn it. We will study it. But you need to understand that this is what we're shooting for, is to see that double helix, this one molecule, that every A goes with a T, every G with a C. That is DNA. The three domains, all right, are very interesting. They're just something that you should know. It's, it's something that we know that all life on Earth, no matter how many, and we think there's about 10 to 100 million uh, species in the world. Uh, we only know of 1.8 million, but if we, let's say it's in the upper end of that range, let's say it's 100 million, all 100 million should fall into these three domains. And the domains are either bacteria, uh, archaea, or eukarya. Eukarya are things with, with nuclei. And the eukarya is broken down into single-celled proteins or multicellular organisms, and we are the animal part of the multicellular organism. So funguses, animals, and plants, and these single-celled proteins all have a nucleus. So that's why we're eukarya. Archaea and bacteria are the other two domains, and they're both prokaryotes. That means they have no nucleus. They all have DNA, but no nucleus. And again, we'll go into that in more detail. But it's just this is one of those themes of life that we're gonna have to we're gonna have to make sure you keep an eye out for as we study. This is what the domains look like. You have, you have, uh, you know, the animal kingdom. You have a fungi or fungus, right? Mushrooms. You have the plant kingdom. Mushrooms are not plants. Or fungi are not plants, just so you know. And proteins are single-celled uh, uh, eukaryotes. So they're single-celled with a nucleus. And you can see the nucleus here in some of these. 
these are bacteria. They have DNA, but there are no nucleus. Some of you asked about E. coli. There's E. coli. There's a, or it could be E. coli. Uh, here's a single-celled organism uh, without a nucleus. So that's what E. coli would look like if you had a, a picture of it that was that close. Archaea, and by the way, not all bacteria look like this. Not all archaea look like this. This is just one species, one example. But here's an example of archaea. These things live in very extreme temperatures or extreme conditions, a, a different domain for, for many different reasons because there's, their structures and functions are, are so different from the way uh, bacteria do what they do. You would think they would be the same since they're both prokaryotes, but they're not. So this is one domain, this is a second domain, and the third domain is eukarya. So evolution being the, being the explanation for things being related and yet different, right? Kinship being means they're being related. Diversity means they're different. How do you explain that a, that a banana has 50% of the same DNA as a human, and yet bananas are so different from humans? Evolution is with the explanation of that. Again, we'll go into detail, but this is just some more uh, background information just so you get, start to get the idea of what we'll be studying when we're talking about diversity and evolution. We're looking at things like natural selection. We're looking at things like Darwin's descent with modification. We're talking about taking a look at observations and, and trying to put them together in some kind of deductive logic. Uh, this is just an explanation of what natural selection is, and it's just a real simple, quick way of looking at what what's, we're going to be studying. So if you have a population that, that has varying traits, and in this population the bird can pick out the white bugs, but the dark bugs are harder to find, well, what are the first, what's going to happen is the birds take away the white bugs, you only have the darker bugs left to have babies, and so what what color are, the, are those bugs likely to be? Dark. And this is evolution, what you see here, a change in gene frequencies over time. That's all evolution is. And that's why it's, it's fairly well supported. All right, so that pretty much does it for evolution. The process of science is just the idea that there's inductive and, induct and deductive reasoning, and we'll talk about what that is a little bit as we move forward throughout the year. It's just the idea that you use a scientific method to uh, come up with a theory. A theory is an explanation of, uh, that has uh, support of scientific evidence or, or empirical support. Uh, in other words, experiments have been done that, that have collected data and have shown that that explanation of those facts or those patterns are, are reasonably correct. So uh, we solve everyday problems by using these hy hypotheses and using deductive reasoning and, and finding out if it's testable. So, you know, taking a look at something we might do uh, in, in everyday life, we make an observation, we ask a question, the flashlight's not working, is your observation, is the battery's dead, or is the bulb burned out? Those are kind of your two hypotheses. As you move forward, you predict, well, if I replace the batteries, it should fix the problem. If it's the batteries, you test and see if that happened. And, of course, if the, if the flashlight still doesn't work, then you got to come back up and maybe you go, up, you go with uh, hypothesis two and you replace the bulb and you find out if that works. Now that, you, now, that you, now that you replace the bulb, it works. So this obviously was the hypothesis that the bulb is burned out was correct. This is the same logic we use in the classroom, in a science classroom or in a science laboratory. So again, these are more details that we don't really need to focus on for now. We're going to need to develop controlled experiments. We'll talk about what controlled experiments are and experimental groups and except example, they looked at mimicry. And so what they looked at, they had two groups, right? And they looked at uh, the idea that an, a king snake versus a coral snake. And they want to know if, uh, if... In this particular example, they looked at, in this scientific, a king snake, which looks very much like a coral snake. It's hard to tell the difference. Uh, if they would attack, or they'd be attacked, uh, depending on what's going on. So they set them up in an environment. They, they made these fake kind of, uh, uh, I think they're poorly done, but what have you. Uh, the snakes, uh, these snakes that look like a snake, the same pattern of colors, and they see if that, by the way, looks like this. This is what happens when those 
snakes are attacked, they're, they're just torn up. If there's been attacks, when you don't have coral snakes around, right, in these artificial, uh, uh, artificial uh, snakes, you don't, have, you don't have any coral snakes, then what happens is you get 83% uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the snakes get attacked. The artificial king snakes get attacked. Uh, but, only, uh, but there's an absence of the brown snakes. Very few of the brown snakes actually get attacked. But when you have coral snakes around, when you look and in, in the, in the animals in the surrounding area know what a coral snake is, right? So somebody's tried to, to eat a coral snake and they died or they got stung real bad or they got bit real bad and the venom made them very sick, they survived, they're highly unlikely that those organisms are going to mess with anything that looks like a coral snake again. So now the, in the experiments that they did, they put the same kind of fake coral snake in that environment, they're much, uh, much less likely to be attacked. And they attack, of course, they're made of rubber or some kind of synth a synthetic material. So what we study, what science is, it tries to understand using a test and a hypothesis is the structures and processes that we can observe and measure. We tend, not to, we tend to stay away from things we can't observe and measure because it's hard to have an objective discussion about it otherwise. So evolution, again, is, is, is tied to our everyday life. It's tied to everything. And one of those things is a, lot of, uh, is a question a lot of people like to ask is antibiotic-resistant bacteria. How do bacteria become antibiotic resistance? We, we would say evolution. So evolution is important in medicine because you have to, you have to consider it when you're doing things like antibiotic resistance or you're, take, you're thinking about how is one species related to another if you're looking for new drugs or you're looking for new ways of, of curing problems. In forensics, obviously, evolution is important. In conversation, it comes up in conversation. So it's really, it's really one of those core ideas of, of biology Evolution is pretty well supported by the data, by the experiments. Uh, very, very, I, I know of very little evidence that would even question the concept of evolution as a sound theory, as a sound explanation for our observations. What happens in the future, who knows, but uh, uh, we, it's something that you really seriously have to start uh, understanding and be able to use and explain uh, it. Do, am I asking you to believe in evolution? Uh, let's not use that word in science class at all because in science we shouldn't be talking about believing. What we need to be talking about is the evidence that we have at hand and the explanation that we have at hand to answer the, uh, the question that we have at hand. Okay, so that takes us through the whole thing. It's a little longer than I wanted it to be, uh, but I hope it helps you understand the themes of biology and what they all mean.